Dr. Terence Farrell, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm very, very pleased to be here, and thank you very much. The privilege is ours. Uh, we've been um, working at getting you here for a long time. So I already laid the case as to why we want to talk about the CCJ, because the CCJ is a number of things. It speaks to the maturity of a people. It speaks to having confidence in your judiciary. What was it? It was um, 10 years. We just celebrated. We are in the 10th anniversary Correct. of the CCJ. Right. And Trinidad and Tobago is not a member of it. Former Jamaican Prime Minister P.J. Patterson criticized Jamaica and Trinidad in delaying its adoption of the Caribbean Court of Justice as the final court of appeal. He said that after 50 years of political independence, the two most populous and arguably most advanced social, political, and economic states of the CARICOM region are still hanging on to the vestiges of the past. That colonial thing that I must go to master, I opined in, I paraphrase that, that thing of going back to the Privy Council as the final court of justice. So my question to you to begin our discussion this morning, Professor Farrell, what is the problem with the CCJ being adopted by the two most populous nations, and as and, and argued by Mr. Patterson, uh, socially advanced nations in the region? What is the problem, sir? Uh, really, I wish I knew. <laughs> uh, I, I, I wish I knew. I, I have, I have um, described the decision to go to the CCJ as a no-brainer. Mm-hmm. It, 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 there is absolutely no reason why, um, particularly Jamaica and, and Trinidad, should not have already acceded to the jurisdiction of the CCJ. And mm-hmm. that's correct you. Um, all of these countries are signatories to the revised Treaty of Chagaramas and to the treaty which establishes the CCJ. So they all are. Yes. Uh, but so what each country then has to do is that they then have to um, go through a process of acceding mm-hmm. to the jurisdiction, which means in many cases that they have to make some changes to their constitution. That's right. Um, it, is, it is really is very ironic. Mm-hmm. Um, in the case of Jamaica, Jamaica, by the way, right at, as we speak, um, the uh, the People's National Party, the PNP, brought legislation to the House of Representatives in Jamaica mm-hmm. a couple of months ago. Uh, legislation to establish the CCJ has been passed in Jamaica in the lower house mm-hmm. by the requisite two-thirds majority. It has now gone to the Senate in Jamaica. Uh, unfortunately, their Senate is not constructed like ours, so there are no independent senators. It's strictly a state of, 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 of government. And, yes, mm-hmm. yeah, right? And uh, you, they require one opposition senator in the Jamaican Senate to... Object. To, uh, to, well, yeah, yes, they require one to have it passed. Uh, that debate is ongoing. At the, at the moment, there's a bit of a contretemps going on in the Senate, and one sp- senator was suspended by the president of the Senate and so on. But that debate is happening now. But mm-hmm. they require one JLP senator to effect vote with the government senators, and if that happens, Jamaica will accede. If it does not happen, it would have been defeated. Mm. And that's and that's really the curious thing, because the, the Senate in Jamaica is like ours. It's unelected. So you would have had a situation where an unelected body or an unelected um, person essentially um, defies the will of the of the of the of the representatives of the people. They saying that this one potential um, um, vote coming out from the GLP it's, will be almost like a Bustamante vote because that could make a whole big it difference. could whole make a big difference. Absolutely, Abs- absolutely, can make a whole big difference. And at, at this point in time, from my sources in Jamaica, it would appear that they really don't know whether or not they can get mm. that that, mm. that one vote. The other irony is there are a couple of many ironies around the CCJ in the region. Um, the the speech at the inauguration of the CCJ in 2005 was delivered by no less a person than Kenny Anthony, mm-hmm. who is now the, the Prime Minister of St. Lucia. Um, but to his credit, I think that the Prime Minister of St. Lucia is now, has now taken steps to have St. Lucia come on board. Mm-hmm. So the, the in St. Lucia, they have passed the legislation. Uh, there was a court matter involving how that could be done. Uh, they now know that they have to write Paradoxically, they now have to write to the Attorney General in the United Kingdom for permission for them not to have a referendum um, to have the CCG, which I suspect that they will get. Mm. So that we expect that St. Lucia is going to come on, Dominica has come on, Belize has come on, Barbados has come on, Guyana has come on. So it is really Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica. And quite frankly, it is... It is, it is, it is, it is scandalous. Um, in the case of Trinidad, as you know, when the CCJ was being, uh, was being set up, um, we, 
uh, are the ones who asked for the, the, the court to be cited here. It was in the Pandey administration that the, the decision was taken to have the court set up in Port of Spain. Uh, when the, the UNC went out of office in 2002, 2000, uh, uh, the UNC then began its process of, 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 of objecting, essentially, to acceding to the jurisdiction of the CCG, and, and, and that is where we are now. So the irony is that Trinidad and Tobago is the seat of the CCJ. The CCJ, by the way, is an, uh, what is called an itinerant court. So it actually can sit anywhere. Right. Uh, you know, and, and, and in the Shunik Myri case, for example, they sat in Jamaica, they sat in mm. Barbados, uh, and, and, and as well as sitting in Trinidad. You lay out a very good picture as to the constitutional imperatives of mm. um, uh, becoming a full-fledged member of the of the CCJ. The, the, the question many ask, however, was this merely a legislative issue that has caused 10 years down the line so many countries to get in, or a case of political will and or fear of political interference in a in a Caribbean court of justice. Uh, the, but let me deal with political interference issue first. Um, the way the the CCJ has been set up, there is really very little possibility of political interference. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, the judges for the CCJ are selected by a regional judicial and legal services commission. So that's a bunch of um, very senior people from around the region who constitute this discussion. This they are the ones who people apply and they are the ones who, who do go through the process selection. Uh, the, the, the prime ministers of the, of the territories cannot um, veto the selection of a judge. Mm-hmm. For that to happen, you would have to have, um, I think it is more than three quarters of them actually actually doing that. So no one prime minister can say, I don't like uh, mm-hmm. Rennie as, 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 as a judge. That, that can't happen. Mm-hmm. So the scope of political interference is, is minimal. Secondly, in terms of, of the, the, the politicians being able to influence the finances of the CCJ, what they very wisely did was that they established a fund, which is a hundred million U.S. dollars, mm-hmm. to which Trinidad and Tobago has contributed and Jamaica has contributed, and it is essentially the mm-hmm. income from that fund, which is managed by an independent set of trustees. It is really the income that from that fund that, that goes to finance the ongoing operations mm-hmm. of the CCJ. So the CCJ is financially independent; it cannot be pressured by any government, mm-hmm. and the selection of the judges who go on to the CCJ is really, quite frankly. I would have to say it's, it's, it's almost immune from political interference. Mm-hmm. But having made that point, um, when people make the point about, about political pressure on judicial officers and so on, the fact of the matter is that pressure on judges, whether you are a magistrate in a magistrate's court or you are on the Supreme Court, uh, there is pressure on our judicial officers. And what judicial officers have to do, and that pressure can come from all kinds of sources. It can come from politicians, it can come from lawyers in front of them, it can come from all kinds of all kinds of directions. People who want to bribe them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and therefore, what you want to do is that you want to have judicial officers who, have, who, are, who are selected, who have the ability to withstand that kind of pressure. So with pressure there is going to be, mm-hmm. but we need to have make sure that we have judicial officers who can withstand that kind of pressure. That's political uh, pressure is one of the issues here, and political mm-hmm. considerations is part of what's going on. Because, folks, uh, I remember you touched on uh, former Prime Minister Kamala Prasad, BCSR, saying that, in fact, uh, we cannot do this by a simple majority. She alluded, of course, to a national referendum as the way to do that. Those in support of a national referendum argue that the public has lost confidence in the country's justice system mm-hmm. by involving the people in the decision it would be a stronger sense of ownership and faith in the CCJ. Uh, is, is, is that really true? I mean, do you need a referendum to do this? Would you say the people are sufficiently aware of what is the role of a CCJ for the general population to go to a referendum on this? I mean, the sort of argument sort of is reminiscent, and I see you smiling, of, of, of the Federation. I mean, Buster Matter took it to his people. Half of them didn't understand what he was talking yes. about. So you picked some little area yes. and got people all That's worked right. up about it and they moved against it. Is this the same thing we could be looking at? Here. Precisely, precisely, and 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 the, the fact of the matter is, there was no referendum for the Privy Council. Exactly, exactly. Yes. <laughs> we had a referendum for the Privy Council. The Privy Council was put into our constitution in 1962, as in all our other constitutions, on because that was the, the final court of appeal that we had at the time. Mm-hmm. Nobody voted for it, and I think now we are in a position where we can make a choice, and it is the representatives of the people, I think, who are elected who can make that choice. Mm-hmm. In our constitution, you have special majorities, and if you can get a special majority, as they have done in Jamaica to pass the legislation, uh, then I think that that is perfectly fine. I don't see there's a need for a referendum. And now, in certain constitutions, for example, I think in St. Vincent and I believe in St. Lucia, their constitution 
requires that for that change that there should be a referendum. Uh, in the in the case of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, um, the, the the Prime Minister there, Mr. Ralph Gonzalez, actually did have a referendum on the question of the CCG, but he also mixed it in with some other questions, mm-hmm. and it was voted down. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the St. Vincent and the Grenadines will come on board. I think that um, Ralph Gonzalez is a committed regionalist, oh, so, yes. uh, and I believe that at some point in time, I mean, whether he survives the next election or not is another matter, but whether he or his successor, I think St. Vincent and the Grenadines will come on board, mm-hmm. and as I mentioned, St. Lucia is in fact going to come there on board. There is the question of judges.